Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, we're a couple minutes late. Um, as always, there was some some new technical challenges with Crowdcast, but uh, we were able to figure it out. So you know, every time we get a little bit better. Um, I see we've got a pretty cool uh, international audience for this talk today, and you know that's really great to see. Uh, I'm Richard, uh, one of the co-founders of Escarpment Labs. Um, tend to spend a lot of my time uh, in the lab, uh, looking at microbes, and you know, getting familiar and learning to think like a microbe, and uh, hoping to pass along a little bit about what I've learned uh, in the last few years of doing brewing microbiology. Uh, and we're also very lucky to have our lab manager here, uh, Louisa. Uh, you know, feel free, feel free to introduce yourself. <laughs> All right, thanks, Richard. Yeah, I'm uh, Louisa. I'm the lab manager at Escarpment Labs. I have joined on with Escarpment um, about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago now. Um, I have been in the brewing industry for uh, about the last uh, five years. Um, and before that, I was a pharmaceutical uh, chemist. So um, well versed in quality assurance um, uh, in that routine. Um, so yeah, we're excited to present to you tonight and I hope you have lots of questions and um, ready to get into it. Absolutely. For those who haven't seen it, uh, Louisa did a talk uh, for the Ontario Craft Brewers Conference on uh, I forget the official title, but it was it was centered around uh, how to write a good SOP, how to write good you know procedural documentation in the brewery. I know that that's not necessarily the most thrilling topic, but it's super important. Uh, and you know, having good SOPs makes it easier to do good work and buys you time to do the fun stuff. So I would highly recommend checking that out. I uh, I looked a few days ago and I was able to just go on the uh, Ontario Craft Brewers Conference website and, and stream that. Um, so I think that might even be available for free. So if so, uh, that's an awesome resource. Would highly recommend checking it out. Um, also, uh, you know, important part of the webinars, uh, what are you drinking? I've got a yellow flowers from Slake Brewing. Uh, it's been pretty much all I've been drinking for the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this beer. It's a low alcohol, Saison, uh, super dry, uh, just really nice and light and balanced. Uh, really enjoying that. Uh, do you have a beer on the go, Louisa? Yeah, I do. I have, it's my last can of Tenebrows from uh, Alora Brewing out in Guelph. It's uh, brewed with our Brute Ale yeast, I believe. It's really nice. I'm sad that I'm on my last can. <laughs> Yeah, man, that's been a huge favorite. Um, the that Kolsch that they brewed with with the brute ale. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we we've had to re up a few times, and it keeps uh, it keeps disappearing. Um, <laughs> just a testament to 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 how much our team loves you know just clean, <laughs> balanced beers and nothing crazy. It's yeah. a really nice one. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome, and yeah, if anyone else is uh, you know trying out a beer that they really want to tell us about, feel free to comment uh, in the comment section. I always love to hear from you guys and, and you know, see what's uh, what's going on out there in the world. Uh, without further ado, I think we're going to get into this. Uh, I've got a little bit of content about some of the fantastic bugs that you're going to find in the brewery and where to find them. And then uh, Louise is going to be bringing it home with some content on uh, how to actually, you know, now that we know who all the cast of characters that we're trying to avoid are, how we're going to bring that home and create a sampling plan and a, and a, you know, a lab plan that that's actually going to, you know, work to identify these things um, and yield real results. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. All right, I think we're good to go here now. Um, so I'm going to get into this. Uh, we're going to be talking about fantastic bugs and where to find them. Very exciting stuff. Uh, so this is where we're going to start things off, um, and why you know why quality is very important to me. Quality control, uh, brewing microbiology is very important to me. Uh, I started home brewing in 2012, 2013, and very shortly thereafter encountered my first contaminated homebrew. And, uh, you know, this is a testament to the fact that, you know, if unless you're looking for a contamination, you don't know whether or not you have it. But, you know, in this case, uh, I was homebrewing for a few months and probably not as careful as I should have been. And uh, 
ended up with a beer that had some pretty nasty off flavors that had some, you know, plasticky phenols and a little bit of acidity. I was, you know, kind of halfway to Lambic, but, you know, not, 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 you know, the, the wrong halfway and uh, ended up with some pretty serious off flavors. But uh, at the time was also sort of um, getting, getting uh, my feet wet with microbiology and was able to bring in some beer samples into a, uh, you know, undergrad class and played it out and discover like, Oh crap. Yep. My beer is, uh, contaminated to hell with, uh, with some lacto and with some wild yeast. So, uh, you know, that was, a a lucky early, uh, experience in, you know, what can go wrong when you aren't careful, um, about your sanitation with your brewing. Um, so I've since, I think, uh, built some somewhat better habits, but of course, you know, contamination is something that we always run the risk of, especially uh, in brewing when, you know, everything is focused on really dialed in processes and on using pure cultures. Um, we do walk that fine line and then the risk is always there, right? So it's something that to always be aware of, you know, whether you're home brewing or whether, um, you know, you're churning out enormous amounts of beer every week in a commercial brewery. So... My goal for this part of the talk is to try to get us to think more like a micro. And uh, to start with that, we, we have to understand you know, what, micro, what resources do microbes need? Why, why might a microbe want to contaminate our beer? What, you know, what is the point? Why is this uh, PDO going to contaminate my beer and make it taste like butter? Why can't it just go away? You know, what's in it for the PDO? So we need to understand, first of all, you know, what resources do the microbes need? Um, and it's, you know, resources are important in every, in every game, right? Um, there's always, you know, a number of different things that a microbe needs, uh, that someone needs in order to win the game. And, you know, it, when we look at life and evolution, it is a game of competition. It is a game of, you know, who can win certain resources faster or better. Um, of course, there might be some sharing and trading along the way, but at the end of the day, um, biology is a game of competition, and oftentimes uh, the behavior that we see in the microbes that we encounter in the brewery uh, is a result of that evolution and that competition. Uh, so in the case of our microbes, we're not really worried about sheep and wheat. We're worried about the basic elements of life. We're worried about uh, these molecules that are absolutely critical to all life on Earth. And, uh, you know, configurations within those that make up pretty much the vast majority of living cells, whether it's bacteria or whether it's yeast, they all have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, or um, this very catchy acronym, CHNOPS, CHNOPS. So, you know, just going back to our little Catan metaphor, it very much can be that case where, you know, yeah, microbes will share resources, but at the end of the day, they all need these and they've got really clever ways that they will compete, really clever ways that they will uh, find to pick up these resources so that they can make more of themselves. And brewery microbes are really smart. Right. If we think like a microbe, uh, we're going to use every tool in our toolbox, whatever tools we have uh, available to us in our genome, you know, whatever tricks we have up our sleeve to uh, grow, to make more of ourselves, to succeed as an organism. Um, if we think about brewery microbes in the most basic terms, though, we know that they need water. Uh, most bacteria, most yeast don't survive very well uh, in a totally dry desert-like environment. That's why nothing grows in a desert because there's no water. Um, they also need carbon. Uh, the way that most of the brewery microbes get carbon is through sugar. There's many, many other ways that uh, microbes um, and organisms in general have figured out how to get carbon. But in the case of our uh, you know, brewery resident yeast and bacteria, it tends to be uh, through sugar sources. And they also need nitrogen. Uh, most of the uh, all of the microbes that we find in a brewery are not capable of uh, taking the nitrogen from the air and turning it into something useful. You know, there are bacteria that can do that. There are organisms that can do that. And that's awesome. We, we need that for the earth to function. Um, but that's not a typical behavior of brewing resident microbes. They tend to uh, require a nitrogen source uh, in the form of something like protein or amino acids in order to grow and make more of them. So uh, let's keep these things in mind when we're talking about, you know, some of the places, for example, that 
contaminant microbes can hide in a brewery and recognize that they need water, they need sugar, they need protein. And anywhere where you're going to find all three of these things, it's probably a place where you're going to find uh, contaminant microbes happily flourishing. And I think this is, you know, very much true. Uh, I love this quote um, from a famous uh, microbiologist, Lawrence Bass Becking. Um, Everything is everywhere, but the environment selects. Um, and, you know, this guy came up with this hundreds of years ago, but it's proven to be, you know, relatively true in a lot of ways in the sense that uh, the capacity for microbes to thrive, especially when we're at the scale of microbes, um, is everywhere. But the type of the environment that they're in does select for who is successful. If you have an environment where an organism that thrives, you know, on a type of sugar that other organisms can't, like, for example, some of this, uh, some of the uh, sugars that are in uh, the fibers of wood, um, then that, that microbe is probably going to thrive in that environment. Uh, because it's in a selective environment that's going to promote its growth. So that might explain why, for example, we find a yeast like Britannomyces um, strongly associated with oak barrels, you know, with wines and beers that sit for a really long time inside oak barrels, because that yeast has figured out how to consume some of those sugars uh, from the wood itself in a way that other microbes haven't. And so it's kind of uh, able to adapt to this niche in the way that other ones can't. And yeah, we're not going to get super into the weeds with Brett today, but that remains one of the mysteries of Britannomyces in the sense that this is a yeast that we never find anywhere in the wild. No one knows what the natural habitat of Brett is. But in the meantime, it's gotten really good at colonizing our oak barrels, our wine ferments, and our beer ferments, and thriving. So I want to ask us, you know, keeping in mind that microbes, you know, they need water, they need sugar, they need uh, nitrogen. Um, what kind of environments in a brewery might they thrive? Like, for example, if you look at these two devices, they're both the same thing. They're both heat exchangers, right? They're both things that you can pump uh, wort into one side, water into the other side. Uh, the wort flows through there. Uh, and, and as it passes through uh, and is cooled by, you know, water, uh, either on other plates or uh, in that counterflow chiller, um, that wort is cooled down. Uh, what might microbes like about one of these things? You know, even if it's relatively clean, what might microbes like about a heat exchanger? Um, knowing that that there's really three key things that they need in a brewery. That's, that's moisture, that's uh, sugar, and that's uh, nitrogen. Well, these things are pretty hard to clean, right? So um, if you've got a heat exchanger that has any built up residue of sugar, if it's got any built up residue of protein like troop uh, from, from your wart, then, then that's creating a favorable environment for microbes to grow. Um, you probably know from experience, either using a homebrew uh, counterflow chiller or using a commercial plate chiller, that these things never really fully dry out. So, you know, the moisture part of the equation is, is always there. Um, and then depending on all sorts of, you know, different things that are done with heat exchangers, different types of wort, there might be, you know, certain types of wort that go through it with a higher protein content, um, especially with New England IPAs and things like that. Um, there is the potential for a favorable environment for uh, a huge range of uh, some of the microbes that we think of as spoilage microbes to grow because, the you know, the environment selects, these things are everywhere, they're you know, there's a little bit of, of uh, bacteria floating around in the air right now. Um, if uh, one that just so happens to love growing in a brewery heat exchanger gets in there and uh, the environment is favorable to it, then it's going to proliferate and it's going to, um, you know, do as much as it can to replicate itself. Um, and if it just so happens that that microbe bacteria is also what we call a spoilage organism, something that can cause off flavor or defect in the beer, then it's going to end up potentially having a problem, uh, creating a problem for the brewer in the long run. Hop strainers. Yeah, that's, an, that's another good one. <laughs> Let's think about this one. I, I think I sort of gave, gave, I buried the lead on this a little bit, but what is special about an oak barrel? What might microbes like about it? 
Well, you've got, typically the oak barrel is not empty, right? You've got stuff in it. You've got liquid in it. Um, that liquid, yeah, you know, finished beer um, does have less resources, less nutrients than a, than a wort, than an unfermented beer, but there's still stuff to work with, right? There's microbes that are really good at using alcohol as an energy source, right? We have to keep in mind that alcohol is also a carbon source. It can also be used for energy. Uh, we can also keep in mind that the vessel itself in this case is a potential nutrient source where there are microbes that have adapted to uh, be able to consume some of the sugars that are, you know, released or, or that are that are part of the structure of the wood. Um, so the wooden barrel creates a favorable environment for microbes that have figured out how to handle or utilize alcohol and that have uh, figured out how to handle or utilize some of those wood sugars. Um, and so that that's why in in a in a wood barrel you have organisms like Britannomyces that that can thrive or or Lactobacillus, um, and, and that's why we we tend to see those in those environments and and maybe not in others. So, my main goal for this talk is we're going to talk about uh, what kind of microbes that we find in the brewery environment, and of course there's two big categories here. There's yeast and there's bacteria. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is the bacteria because we already have delivered uh, a fair bit of content on some of the common uh, yeast uh, spoilers in beer. Uh, we've we've had a few different uh, webinars that cover the topic of diastatic yeast and that is you know very much um, public enemy number one uh, in terms of beer spoilage on the yeast side. Um, we've also talked a fair bit about Britannomyces as well, which I'll say is uh, it can cause huge problems if it gets into a beer, but we have to keep in mind that uh, the environments where Brett is favored and not outcompeted by other microbes are limited. And so, you know, that tends to be mostly restricted to things like um, barrels, wooden barrels, or, um, you know, if you have a tiny bit of Brett contamination and a beer's in the bottle, then, then eventually the Brett's going to do something. Um, but in general, it's uh, a little bit easier to control than diastaticus. So for today, I'm going to focus on the bacteria. And I also just wanted to show this picture because I thought it was really fun. Um, a picture of a mixed culture that I took last summer um, that shows all of our sort of key players, at least, at least in terms of positive mixed cultures, positive bacteria and yeast uh, in brewing. So we can see that there's some pediococcus here, some of those cocci round-shaped bacteria. Uh, we can see some rod-shaped bacteria, some probably some lactobacillus over here. Um, we can see some big round yeast, uh, probably Saccharomyces over here, um, budding wherever they want, multilaterally, as well as some apiculate yeast, so yeast that buds on either end, which then makes the cells more uh, sausage-shaped or elongated, um, and that's very typical of a yeast like Britannomyces. So I, know, I thought that was a fun picture because this shows... Um, a mixed culture that has all of these things in it. In this case, uh, these things were all added there with intention, so that's great. Um, but if you were to see this in a beer that you thought was clean, then uh, the warning signals should probably be going off at that point. Um, and, and another thing I wanted to highlight is that it's really hard to detect uh, when we get to the bacteria. It's really hard to detect these things um, because they're so small, right? We can look at this pediococcus cell and see that it's uh, quite a bit smaller than this yeast cell. You know, this, this image is at a thousand times magnification. Um, folks who are, you know, using standard uh, microscopes 400 times uh, might not even see these things under the scope. So um, that's also why, you know, we get into some of the uh, other detection methods for bacteria. So how do we detect microbes? Um, Louise is going to cover a little bit of this content as well. Um, and we also do cover... Uh, spoiler detection methods in some of the other Escarpment Labs webinars. Uh, Alex Mitro did a great talk where he covered, um, you know, some of the some of the brewing lab hacks that you can do from things as simple as a forced diacetyl test through to sort of a basic plating uh, program. Um, and I will say, uh, in our opinion, plating is still the gold standard. So, you know, taking your sample and putting it onto an agar plate that is selective or differential for whatever microbe you're trying to screen for, uh, still very much the gold standard. It has its limitations in the sense that agar prep is uh, labor intensive. Um, there can be you know, some error in the sense that you can have contaminations from the environment. 
Um, but that being said, it still works extremely, extremely well. Although um, we are seeing increased adoption of molecular techniques like PCR, um, which you know some, some breweries will use as the sole uh, method for quality control analysis, and some will use as a supplement to plating. Uh, PCR is great, but you know sometimes uh, sometimes PCR is also bullshit. So uh, it, it's important, you know, if you are using PCR, uh, to make sure that there are at the very least relevant controls um, and that there is a way to, you know, do a biological screen as well. Um, that being said, you know, this is great if you're looking for a specific spoiler. If you're looking for something like the STA1 gene from diastaticus, or if you're looking for something like the hop resistance genes from the lactic acid bacteria, uh, it's a great technique to sort of drill down on those details. So going into our bacteria, I'm going to suggest a few different ways to slice and dice how we categorize bacteria to make it easy, because this is a huge world. We're very lucky in the sense that the, the, the types of bacteria that thrive in beer or in breweries are, are relatively limited. That being said, we still do have a pretty wide cast of characters. Um, so I'm gonna suggest a few different ways that we can sort of slice and dice things. Um, based on the different properties of those bacteria. And then, you know, using those different criteria, it makes it very easy for us to actually identify what a given bacteria might be um, so that we can, you know, get a basic identification and determine next steps and potential root causes in the, in the event of a contamination. Um, so the first one, the really big one is whether or not it's tolerant to oxygen. Um, you know, we think of oxygen as a really good thing as humans because uh, we, our, our metabolism is fine-tuned to get the most energy from respiration. You know, we're, we're good at breathing, getting energy from that, and uh, the alternative, which is fermentation, which we can ferment, you know, probably learned this in high school, but if you're, you know, working out too hard and you start to feel the burn, that's, that's literally lactic acid fermentation happening in your muscles. Um, so you can also ferment, but it's not as efficient. But some bacteria are not wired that way. Some do not tolerate oxygen. Oxygen is actually pretty toxic. And uh, a lot of uh, organisms such as us have come up with ways and have special enzymes that help us deal with the toxicity of oxygen. Um, but others do not. So, you know, as an example, um, there are uh, some, some bacteria that absolutely require oxygen. So Acetic acid bacteria are the classic example there, things like Acetobacter. Uh, they need oxygen uh, to do anything, um, especially when it comes to um, utilizing sugars or alcohol um, as a carbon source to grow more of themselves. Um, so we think of those as uh, bacteria that are obligate aerobes that require oxygen. So that's a really easy screen, right? You can take a tube or a plate and you know have it incubated aerobically and anaerobically, and based on what you get out, you tend to have a good idea of um, whether or not it's an acetic acid bacteria, right? Like if something grows in the presence of air, but not not anaerobically, um, it's a good, uh, there's a good chance that it's probably some kind of acetic acid bacteria if it's coming out of beer. And then we have, you know, some of these other situations where, you know, there might be a, a microbe that is an obligate anaerobe. It does not tolerate air whatsoever. Um, and some lactic acid bacteria, for example, uh, can be that way. And lactic acid bacteria are a good and frustrating example here because um, they can be all of these things depending on the species and depending on the strain. Um, we also have what we call facultative anaerobes. So um, bacteria that uh, they, they can tolerate uh, anaerobic conditions, but they also like uh, aerobic conditions. And then also these aerotolerant anaerobes that don't really care. Um, and among the lactic acid bacteria, we have all of these behaviors, which then makes, uh, for, for those of us growing uh, lactic acid bacteria for uh, purpose of creating cultures, this becomes a challenge. The other big way we can slice and dice bacteria is in how their cell wall is structured. So. When we talk about the cell wall of bacteria, we tend to talk in terms of this thing called the gram stain. Uh, it's actually named after a guy, so that's that's why it's always capitalized. Uh, but the gram stain is, is a really cool technique because it's a way to differentiate between uh, how the cell wall of the bacteria is structured 
And this, this so happens to uh, be one of the main differences between different groups of bacteria. Uh, the gram-positive ones have these really thick layers of, of, uh, of this thing called peptidoglycan, um, sort of a, a sugar shell um, that they can, that, that helps to protect the cell. Um, so for example, uh, bacteria like lactobacillus uh, are gram positive. They have this thick pe peptidoglycan layer. Uh, it, it does help to protect the cell uh, against environmental stresses. Um, these guys tend to be able to, you know, dry out a little bit better. You know, lacto can be dried or freeze dried, for example, fairly easily. Um, so that's a pretty cool feature of them. Uh, it tends to make it harder to get DNA out of these things. So uh, when we look at those molecular techniques like PCR, um, it tends to be a lot harder to get DNA out of these versus these. So that's always something that needs to be kept in mind um, for any of those DNA extraction protocols. Um, if someone's doing PCR, um, whether it's sort of in-house or with a kit. Uh, and then the gram negative cells um, have thinner peptidoglycan walls. So they have a thinner layer. Um, they might uh, also, they would also have an outer membrane, which then allows them to uh, accumulate some extra features that might um, allow them to obtain better resistance to, you know, to other, other kinds of stressors. So, you know, for example, um, acetic acid bacteria uh, are, are gram negatives, but uh, they, they may have, uh, you know, other interesting features, like sometimes they have flagella, meaning that they can actually move around and, you know, that gives them a bit of an advantage. Um, so this is a really important separation. It's different ways to test for it. The classic one is the gram stain um, that everyone learns in, in well, I guess if you went to school for microbiology, I guess not everyone learns the gram stain, but uh, that's sort of the classic one. It involves, you know, taking some of your bacteria and you can actually see the pictures here, um, putting it on a slide and staining it, destaining it, uh, counter staining it, et cetera. Uh, on that slide, it's a bunch of steps. It's pretty error prone. Uh, honestly, do not recommend it to beginners. Um, there is an easier way that we tend to recommend. It's this uh, potassium hydroxide test. Uh, the cool thing with that is that potassium hydroxide at that concentration of three and a half percent penetrates the thin cell walls of the gram negative bacteria. So the ones that have that thinner peptidoglycan layer. And uh, that then means that the DNA is released from the cell, which then makes the liquid stringy. So you literally just like take a colony of your bacteria, put it on a glass slide, uh, add a drop of potassium hydroxide, swirl it up, wait a minute, and then check and see if it's stringy. If it's stringy, it's gram negative, right? DNA has been released. It's got a thin cell wall. If it's not, it's probably gram positive. This isn't a perfect test, but it's really fast and it's a really easy way that it, you know, if you're doing uh, microbiology in your brewery lab, you've got colonies on a plate. Um, this is one of the tools you can use to really quickly narrow down what kind of bacteria you might be faced with um, in the span of minutes, right? You know, th there's no reason you can't get close to, you know, a positive ID on a, on a brewing uh, bacteria in, in a few minutes, unless you get uh, into some of the pretty crazy edge cases. And we'll talk about a couple of those. Another key way that we can separate bacteria is the catalase test. So um, the catalase test uh, tests basically for the presence of the catalase enzyme, which is most typically found in aerobic organisms um, that can split that hydrogen peroxide uh, molecule um, and make it less toxic. Um, that being said, there are also some, some bacteria that are anaerobic that, that can also use this enzyme. Um, and this is another key way that we can differentiate bacteria. Another great thing about it is it's super fast. You can do it on a slide with a colony and it literally, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, uh, drugstore hydrogen peroxide will work for this. Uh, or you can even take just like a dropper of that hydrogen peroxide, put it on a colony on your agar plate and uh, also um, do the test that way. So it's just very, very fast and simple and tells us some information about that bacteria. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. You can go into more detail and, and there are many other tools that can be used to identify bacteria. But to be honest, for the vast majority of brewery QC situations, that's pretty much it. We can ask four questions and have a pretty good sense of what we're looking at, right? Is it, what does it look like under the microscope? 
does it tolerate oxygen? Is it gram positive or negative? And is it catalase positive or negative? And using that information, we can narrow down most brewing bacteria. So I have been making this. This is our alignment chart of uh, of uh, of brewery spoilers. So you know, anywhere from lawful good being uh, okay, just pasteurize your beer, and then you don't have to worry about anything ever again. Uh, but that's kind of boring, right? Um, through to, uh, of course, chaotic good is cool shipping and just welcoming everything from the air into your wart. Um, you know, down to, I would say, uh, Pediococcus is our is our pretty classic neutral evil character. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a menace, but you kind of know how to deal with it. And then to uh, something something weirder like Zymomonas that is um, total chaotic evil because it only pops up rarely, and when it does, it's really hard to trace down. <laughs> so also the other thing I wanted to mention is that in addition to science, uh, to the tools of science that are at your disposal, follow your nose. Um, this is something I learned really early on from uh, from a, a veteran microbiologist is uh, you can learn a lot uh, from microbes uh, on a plate or in a food from from smelling it, right? Uh, and this is especially true for beer. A lot of the spoilage organisms in beer do have pretty signature aromas uh, that, that you can uh, use uh, as one of the tools here to help uh, determine what has gone wrong and what might be contaminating the beer, whether it's uh, you know, phenolic aromas from wild yeast, whether it's um, acidity from lactic acid bacteria, diacetyl from, from uh, pediococcus. Um, use your sensory skills, use your nose. It's, uh, it's an amazing uh, instrument that you have uh, and, and everyone has one. So uh, always make that a recommendation as well. So we're going to get into some of the specific characters. Uh, we're going to talk about the acetic acid bacteria first. Um, and I wanted to provide some examples as well of what these things actually look like, because we do get um, sometimes folks asking us, you know, what does acetobacter or lacto actually look like on a plate? Um, so I wanted to include that. So our acetic acid bacteria, uh, I mentioned this before, but this is kind of the key differentiator is that oxygen. They need oxygen. Um, so if, for example, you're doing uh, your plating and you're doing uh, your MRS plate or whatever plate you're using uh, aerobically and anaerobically, if you get colonies popping up aerobically uh, and they're bacteria, but not anaerobically, then there's a pretty high likelihood that you've got acetic acid bacteria or some kind of other um, aerobic uh, beer or uh, brewery spoiler uh, on your hands. Uh, this is especially true if you're plating out, a, you know, a beer sample where, you know, beer itself is is pretty pretty uh, stressful to to microbes in the sense that the alcohol content can be inhibitory to a lot of microbes. Um, the hops, of course, can be a, a challenge as well. So if you've got final beer and you've got bacteria growing aerobically but not anaerobically, there's a pretty strong chance that it's acetic acid bacteria and you could smell the plate, and uh, if it smells vinegary or kind of funky, then there's an even stronger chance that it's acetic acid bacteria. Um, and it is a, a common thing we see. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, we often do pick up acetic acid bacteria in finished beer. That being said, it doesn't necessarily always lead to off flavors because you might pick up a little bit of acetic acid bacteria from hoses or gaskets or fillers but if it's going into a you know a can or a bottle of beer and there's not a lot of oxygen in that environment then those bacteria that you know they might be alive for a little bit but they might not be able to do anything because they don't have access to oxygen so it also can cause a lot of uh, what i would say you know uh false positives or false freakouts uh with contamination it is always you know something that we try to mention with uh apparent acetic acid bacteria contamination is like okay we know it's there, but you know now you need to monitor the beer to see if there's actually an impact on flavor, and you know definitely look upstream to dial in the processes. But this might, you know, you might not have to dump this batch. So where do we find them? Um, I alluded to a little bit of that, but uh, anywhere that there's oxygen is probably a place that you're going to find acetic acid bacteria in a brewery, um, especially if there's uh faulty seams in in the in the packages uh like cans things like that uh as well as of course barrels where uh if a barrel dries out or or isn't topped up it can have some oxygen 
Uh, heat exchanges is a really common place to find them because uh, especially, you know, closer to um, the inlet outlet, uh, it's a place where it's wet. There's often food for the bacteria and uh, access to oxygen, um, as well as any dead legs and sample valves in the brewery process. Uh, and then a big one as well is the packaging rinse water, especially if it's not filtered, uh, it tends to be a place where uh, acetic acid bacteria can can hang out and really anywhere on packaging lines, uh, especially if, if it's areas that aren't uh, cleaned. Um, usually brewers are pretty good about cleaning the fill heads, but um, some of the other areas on the, on the canning line uh, often do require some attention. Our lactic acid bacteria. So these are uh, honestly public enemy number one when it comes to um, brewery spoilers. These are the ones that are both very common to find in beer and also most likely to cause problems, uh, to cause flavor defects in the beer. Um, so that includes lacto and pedio as well as a couple other, uh, a couple other lactic acid bacteria. Um, on the science side, all of these are changing. So all of the names of these are going to change in the next few years. So um, hold on to your hats for that. It's going to be a wild ride as we all try to figure out what uh, lacto brevis is now. Um, and yeah, these are characterized by being gram positive. So they're not going to be stringy when you do that KOH test and by being catalase negative. So, you know, for us, if we see something that's growing on plates aerobically and anaerobically or just anaerobically, um, and then we do those quick tests, catalase and gram, um, then we have a pretty good uh, guess that that thing we're encountering is a lactic acid bacteria. And then again, you got to use your nose, um, a yogurty, cheesy smell on the plates uh, or in the beer, uh, as well as any changes to the beer texture. You know, they can get what's called sick or ropey. Uh, the bacteria can produce these uh, polysaccharides that thicken the beer, um, or they can cause some turbidity in clear beers or, uh, of course, acidity. You know, the, the crazy thing about lactic acid bacteria, sometimes you'll see turbidity or ropiness before you even see acidity. So um, definitely some freaky things have happened um, that we've um, had the fortune of, of uh, you know, getting a chance to investigate. Um, but again, use your nose because, you know, to me, uh, lactic acid bacteria are pretty easy to pick out on a plate. They, they actually do smell like yogurt. Where do we find them? And this is part of the reason why these things are so uh, so much of a, of a problem and so common in brewing is they're, they're really well adapted to everything that goes on in a brewery. You're going to find lactic acid bacteria on your grain, uh, on the dust that comes off your grain when you mill it. You're going to find it on your fruit. You're going to find it on a lot of other raw materials. Uh, you know, even, even sometimes hops, you can find lactic acid bacteria. So this stuff's kind of everywhere. And, you know, part of the problem is that it's, it's on us too, right? If, uh, humans have lactobacillus and lactic acid bacteria as part of their own microflora, you know, all over and inside their bodies. So um, it's kind of hard to avoid because, you know, humans ourselves are also um, pretty closely associated with lactic acid bacteria. So obviously wash your hands. Um, but of course, they can hide out in other places where they're going to have water and food. So dead legs and sample valves, uh, commonplace, cracked hoses. Um, don't do this. Um, if a hose is uh, repeatedly, you know, flexed, unflexed, uh, sometimes, uh, especially with heating and cooling, you can get cracks on the inside of the hoses. Um, and then if you've got a crack where there's some moisture, uh, you're running wort through it, you're running beer through it, whatever, maybe it's not perfectly uh, rinsed out. Um, you can also have, you know, that little crack, that little environment also have a decreased uh, oxygen content and might be a little bit more favorable to the lactic acid bacteria as well. So, Watch out for hoses. Um, yeast, yeast brinks, uh, that can be a place for a small contamination to build up and uh, become a lot more obvious over time. Um, you can find these things hanging around packaging equipment. You can also find them in dirty CO2 lines. So uh, we've heard of some scenarios where breweries have had, you know, a, a beer get contaminated with lacto and then another one with lacto and another one with lacto. And they go and they do the root cause analysis and they see, okay, these three tanks are are in line with each other, you know, off the CO2 header. And we're able to determine that the lactic contamination was actually coming from the CO2 lines because, you know, a little bit of liquid, a little bit of uh, beer had backflushed into the CO2 lines enough for 
some some lactic acid bacteria to grow, and then that was basically being blasted into those tanks uh, and causing these contaminations. So, <laughs> put filters on your CO2 lines, please. Um, the next ones uh, are the wart spoilers. So, I mean, I've included the poop emoji here because these are uh, mostly uh, uh, bacteria that are associated with uh, gut microbiomes. Uh, they're the enterics. They're, uh, uh, they might not necessarily make your beer uh, smell like poop, but they are you know, very strongly associated with poop. Um, the way that we can tell those apart is that those are gonna be uh, gram negative and catalase positive, uh, just like our acetobacter, but they're gonna be able to tolerate anaerobic conditions. So that's really the big difference between them. And then oftentimes, if you smell them on a plate, they're, they're not going to smell very pleasant. Um, the good thing about enterics is that, uh, is that they're typically inhibited by the alcohol. So you're not going to find these in finished beer. Um, and But one of the challenges here is that a beer that has off flavors resulting from these things, that has, um, it can be anything like DMS, vegetal flavors, or you know more uh, sulfury flavors. Um, a beer that shows some of those off flavors may not show any colony growth later on. So, you know, if there's a beer that's showing crazy off flavors, but the finished beer shows no micro deficiencies, then it's always good to go and look, you know, what was the lag time on that ferment? If that, if that beer took an extra day or two to start fermenting, then uh, you can sort of start uh, pointing your root cause towards uh, wart spoilers. And then some of these things can persist uh, as well. Um, in things like biofilms. Um, so it, it is common for these things to uh, establish themselves as biofilms in places like uh, heat exchangers, hoses. Um, and uh, when they form biofilms, it, it can be harder to kill them off because you have um, a way for the bacteria to kind of protect themselves. So as I said, heat exchanger, uh, humans have to wash their hands. Uh, rinse water can be a potential source, although you know I would say most municipal water is quite quite microbiologically clean, and uh, you know once again cracked and dirty hoses um, definitely worth uh, watching out for those as well. So I will say before we continue on to some of the edge cases, uh, ninety percent of the more than ninety percent of the spores that we encounter in breweries are really do these three, acetic acid bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, wart spoilers, at least when we're looking on the, on the bacteria side. Uh, I would also say that, you know, most of the times if we see yeast contaminants, it's diastaticus or, you know, uh, some other um, wild yeast, um, wild saccharomyces rather than um, something like Brett, um, just as an aside. Um, that being said, we can go into some of the other ones, but I just wanted to, you know, point out that most of the problems that you encounter uh, in brewery spoilage uh, in terms of bacteria are the same players. Um, so, you know, I know it's very daunting to sort of get into brewing microbiology, but at the same time, um, we're very lucky in the sense that the number of uh, threats that we are faced with is relatively limited. So this is a kind of cool one. One of our oddballs, Zymomonas. I referred to it as the chaotic evil uh, bacteria earlier. Um, it's kind of a weird one because it's an anaerobe, but it's catalase positive, um, which is which is kind of perplexing. But that is also the way to um, that is also you know one of the ways to set it apart um, from from some of the other microbes. Of course, it, it can be a little bit tricky to differentiate the Zymomonas from some of the enterics, other than the fact that it will survive in finished beer. It will survive in uh, alcohol conditions, and in fact. Uh, some of these bacteria are used in biotechnology to produce alcohol because they can tolerate pretty high alcohol content. Um, one of the tells for Zymomonas is that it makes a really strong DMS aroma. Um, so if, if a beer is um, presenting with a lot of DMS, that cooked cabbage, vegetal smell, um, and uh, has picked up a lot of turbidity uh, and shows some of these catalase positive, gram negative, colonies, um, chances are that you're facing a Zymomonas contamination. Um, of course, one of the challenges of Zymomonas is that it's not always culturable. So you might 
have a pretty strong suspicion that it's there, but not even be able to get it to grow uh, on plates. And you know, part of that is that it just hasn't been well studied enough to necessarily have um, really great uh, microbiological detection media um, to necessarily pick up all of these things. And I will say we, we've only really found one case where, where Zymomonas was an issue. It's relatively uncommon. Um, in craft breweries. Um, and the reason for it is that it's an anaerobe. Uh, it doesn't really like oxygen very much. And uh, in, in craft breweries, dissolved oxygen tends to be a, a bigger thing. Although as, as, as breweries are getting better at oxygen control, really driving down those DOs in packaged beer, um, this is becoming more of a potential problem. Uh, it is more of a problem um, you know, with, with big breweries that have really good control over in package DO, it can be a problem for bottle conditioned beers as well, because the yeast that's used for bottle conditioning, uh, will gobble up all that oxygen. And then this is also something that can hide out in CO2 lines. Um, because, you know, you've got a little bit of food there, you've got, uh, a low oxygen environment. This is a, this is a place where, you know, this guy can, can hide out and thrive. This should say oddball number two. That's my mistake. Um, the other one we're going to talk about is uh, what uh, brewer scientists call MPEC or Megasphera pectinatus. Uh, two pretty closely associated or related um, bacteria. They do look different. So Megasphera, that's a pretty easy one to understand. You know, big spheres. It is a big spherical bacteria. And pectinatus is a, is a, is a rod shape. But they have very similar behaviors. Um, this is a catalase negative gram negative uh, bacteria. Um, the tricky thing about these guys is that they can they can be fully anaerobic or they can tolerate some oxygen. So it can be a little bit tricky to identify them. Um, if you can get them growing, it often does require some follow up uh, sequencing just to confirm that this is actually what you're looking at. Um, their tell, once again, follow your nose. It's really, really valuable. Uh, the tell for these guys is that they have a really strong, cheesy, funky kind of smell. Like they kind of have this cheesy, sweaty foot kind of kind of aroma. Um, and not in like a pleasant Britannomyces way, in like a pretty unpleasant way. Um, and so that that's a, a pretty good way to, you know, also support an identification of these things. Um, they're ethanol sensitive. So... Um, that's a really important one. You're not going to find it in a, in a high alcohol beer or even in most normal alcohol beers. Um, the, the one case where we encountered these guys was in a beer that was uh, 4% alcohol. Um, so it uh, tends to be more of a problem with, with lower ABV beers. I expect that you know, as more uh, low and no alcohol beers are produced, um, especially in, in small breweries, that, that this might become more of a problem. Um, and this is more common of a problem in larger breweries that have better oxygen control, but also as small breweries uh, improve control of dissolved oxygen in the beer, uh, we're probably gonna see these bacteria become more of an issue. So uh, just like our, uh, our Zymomonas, we're, we're gonna find these in, in places like dirty CO2 lines. We're gonna find them in low alcohol beers potentially. Uh, as well as beers packaged with low DO. That tends to be where they, they hide out. Um, and there are some specialized media to identify them as well um, that are available for people who are doing brewing micro, but it's not really something that I would bother keeping in the arsenal on a regular basis uh, until you know there's a reason to look specifically for um, Megasphera and Pectinatus. So putting it all together, this is just sort of one example of taking, taking these things and trying to make sense of it all. You can sort of treat this as a bit of a choose your own adventure um, to get to a quick bacterial identification, um, ideally in a few minutes, um, knowing that really the bacterial world in beer is relatively limited. And that means that we can use a few simple tests to you know have a good sense of what we might be looking at. So this is there's there's many different ways that this can be flipped around, but this is this tends to be the way that I look at it when when I'm trying to diagnose um, a, a bacterial contamination in a beer. 
Uh, I want to know, you know, is it growing aerobically or anaerobically? What is the catalase test result? That's just putting that drop of drugstore peroxide on a colony. Uh, what is the gram test result? So that's that's testing testing a colony with the potassium hydroxide, uh, seeing if it's stringy or not. And then based on those, I can we can get a pretty decent answer. Um, knowing that most of the time we're going to arrive at lactic acid bacteria, wart spoilers, or acetic acid bacteria, um, there are, um, of course, you know, some we, even using these simple tests, we can identify some of these uh, less common bacteria as well. And I will say that this is relatively simplified. You know, I'm not really doing lactic acid bacteria justice, keeping in mind that that is a very diverse, a hugely diverse group of bacteria, some of whom pose a bigger risk to your beer than others, right? You know, a lactic acid bacteria strain, a lacto that uh, doesn't have hop resistance and tastes good is probably not going to be that much of a risk because as long as your beer has hops in it, it's going to be benign. Uh, whereas something that uh, is hop resistant, alcohol resistant, and makes off flavors, um, like some of the uh, cases of barrel aged beers that had to be dumped. Um, because of this lactobacillus uh, acetotolerance that was, you know, tolerating uh, all sorts of crazy stressors like 15% alcohol stout uh, and, and producing off flavors. Uh, that would be a much bigger risk than that like hop insensitive lactose. So I'm not really doing them justice, but this is like a way that you can sort of visualize, you know, how this kind of thing uh, works. Um, and that, you know, this world of brewing micro uh, brewing bacteria is really not that complicated and that you can arm yourself with very, very simple tools, um, especially if you're already doing a little bit of plating in your brewery lab um, to make it easier to identify things. And then, of course, if you're uh, facing a situation where you're totally stumped, uh, you think you've got something crazy, but you're not sure um, that's that's a case where you can always, you know, consult uh, some experts. You can contact us. We've had a few cases where someone said, hey, I think I've got pediococcus. Can you guys check it out? And, you know, we can get the plate. We have some additional tools like PCR and sequencing that can help to identify things uh, to a greater degree of certainty. Um, and that's, that's always uh, really exciting, you know, on our end is to sort of help out with that problem solving process. That's it for me. Oops. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the torch over to Louisa to bring this one home. All right, thanks Richard. I am aware of the time, so I'm going to just uh, breeze through some of the slides that you've sort of already covered and I'm not going to have our audience sit through that same information again. Um, but thank you. That was really thorough. That was so Richard gets to do the exciting part and I get to do the <laughs> I get to go back to my comfy, you know, little boring corner here that I love so much. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so we're going to talk to you like, how do we put this all together? How do we make this work in a busy brewery? You are a lot of these a lot of the guys that are out there I know um, uh, don't have the resources for a lab. Um, it is important so we're here again to uh, preach that and to uh, like give you a starting point. Um, we can go to the next slide Richard. I don't think I have control. okay so we um, I just wanted to give you an overview of what a quality assurance and quality control program looks like. Um, there's many facets to it. Um, we're just going to focus right now on the micro part of a, of a QC program, but to have a robust program, you really want to have a good sensory program. You want to be testing your beers at least weekly. Um, you want to look at your physical, your phys chem properties of your, of your, uh, of your beer at every stage of, um, fermentation and packaging as well. And you want to also check your, uh, finished product, but. Um, today, we're just going to talk about micro. It's a big piece. It's a piece that um, I find that brewers are the most um, uh, intimidated by. So let's get into that. Next slide. Um, yeah, so Richard already went over all the microflora that you can uh, potentially see in a brewery. Um, I'm going to go over some key sampling points that are common to all breweries. Um, uh, we're going to talk about media choice. 
uh, and testing frequency as well. So I won't get into the PhysChem testing or the packaging or sensory program, but they are very important. So, um, you know, you want to have some time for those as well. And I won't go into nitty gritty methodology either, but I will point you to some resources for that. Um, just briefly, uh, a quality assurance program is just a, a safety net. Um, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to be more proactive um, with your uh, with your beer and with your the issues that you might encounter in your brewery instead of being reactive and um, trying to fix problems once they've already um, kind of gone out, out of control. So um, this will be sort of, you know, it, it's kind of like playing detective doing this. You want to find those clues early um, and you want to uh, hammer down and try to um, eradicate anything that might become a problem later down the line. Um, yeah, so you can skip this slide. This is just a, a summary of what's in the uh, presentation. Um, why? All right, so Richard already, already alluded to this, um, but you put in a, a lot of work into your beer. Um, it's, it's a lot of physical work. It's a lot of thought and care and love and attention <laughs> and struggle that you put into it. And it would be such a shame to let a lot of that go to waste just because you weren't checking up on what might, what, you know, may enjoy lurking in those little spots um, that you haven't really uh, paid attention to. Next. Uh, and you, um, you may have went to brewery school <laughs> and you have, may have learned everything um, that, a, that a good CIP involves. Um, you probably had your pump sco uh, scoped out to, to be the right um, size for your tasks. Um, you may be, you know, checking that you're dosing correctly. Uh, you, your spray ball, you probably go up and, and check that your spray ball is unclogged. But this is a lot that we're asking. <laughs> this is a lot that we're asking without checking up on and validating. Um, so regardless of your best intentions, things happen. Um, hoses get old and get cracked, like, uh, like Richard mentioned. There might be a bad weld in your tank. Um, and microbes love hanging around in bad welds. Uh, there might be dead legs, areas that you can't, that your CIP can't reach that you may not even thought of. Um, so without that validation, which I know Sheena mentioned in the, in the chat here, without that sort of checking in on and validation, um, we're really doing this blind, which is kind of, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. So, um, so we do need to, to uh, take these samples and check to see that we're actually cleaning properly. Next. All right, so where do you start? Um, the process is long. Um, there's many places you can sample from, but to make this simple, uh, start with three points. Uh, you wanna check your wart right after a heat exchanger, it should be sterile, right? So um, that's point number one. Um, anything coming out of there should have no growth. Um, you may be surprised what you find. Hopefully you don't find anything and hopefully you never find anything, but heat exchangers are notoriously hard to clean. Um, you want to check your yeast, make sure it's pure, make sure there's nothing else growing in it. While you're there, do a viability count, <laughs> do, a, do a cell count as well. <laughs> um, that's something that a lot, you know, we wish more people would do before, uh, before brewing. So if you're there and you're going to be doing a micro sample, also get a count as well. Um, and then your last point um, is your finished beer. There's many points you can look at in between, but we wanna keep this simple. And I'm trying to um, be aware of your time um, and what you can realistically accomplish in a week. So start with these three points and um, uh, to get your program started. Oh, next. Uh, and again, yeah, there's tons of places you can sample from in a brewery. Um, you want to look at, you know, if you're if you have a centrifuge before and after, before and after filtering, because potentially that would be a terrible spot for things to be introduced, but it could happen. Things can get introduced there. Um, when you look at your packaging, you may want to look at the some cans at the beginning of your run versus some cans at the end of your run uh, to see what the microbial load is at, at each point. Um, all of these things will give you clues if there is contamination on where that contamination is, is hiding. So once you get proficient at doing those three spots, add in another spot, add in two more spots, um, and then you'll get more um, clarity and granularity about your whole process. Next. 
and how often. Uh, this is really up to you. So um, depends on how often you brew, um, how much staff do you have to run these tests? How much time do you have? Um, how much of a control freak are you? <laughs> how controlled do you wanna get? Um, so really it is up to you to do this, but as a starting point, I would recommend um, look at your, your wort once a week, um, look at your yeast at every harvest and check your finished beer with every packaging run. How do you sample? Um, it could be as simple as a mason jar that's been sanitized. Um, we like to talk about this a lot, but uh, if you can't afford a big fancy autoclave, an instant pot does work in a pinch. Um, so any kind of reusable jars, uh, throw them in an instant pot um, for sanitation. Um, I like to, you know, I've used whirl packs in the past that they're they're great, um, as well as just, you know, little pea cups <laughs> as well. Those are nice, they come sterile or falcon tubes come sterile already. They're easy to use. Whirl packs are nice for carbonated beer um, so that, you know, you don't get explodey <laughs> containers if you can't sample it right away. Um, all right, so next slide. Oh, and I, I forgot to mention, but I'll mention it now. You want to take your sample aseptically. So this is probably the most important part um, with your program. If you don't take a clean sample, an aseptic sample, you're putting that whole test at risk, right? So you may be introducing stuff that isn't really in your beer, but just is in the environment around your beer. So you're going to want to um, clean your sample port really well with some isopropanol. Um, and then you want to flush your sample port for longer than you'd think. Um, give it a really good long flush um, and then take a sample there from there. Um, when you're sampling anything that's already canned or bottled, you're going to want to clean the mouth of that area with some isopropanol. Um, flame it if you wish. You just have to be really, really careful if you're doing that. And then uh, take the sample um, around a flame. So make sure that it's in an aseptic field. Next. And then how do you determine if you have some mic bad micros present? So plating, uh, as Richard said, is still gold standard. Um, unfortunately, for some high, throughput, high throughput breweries, plating is just not fast enough. Um, we have to wait at least three days to get some growth. Um, so more and more breweries are turning to PCR. Uh, it's a lot more affordable than it ever has been. Um, you just have to make sure you're using the appropriate controls if you're doing that. Um, False, uh, false positives, false negatives occur. Um, we um, we do have a really great video that Alex Mitro, one of uh, one of our other employees at Escarpment, has put together that really goes through the basics of PCR and what some of the pros and cons are. We also have a protocol on our website that you can follow if you um, which you would require a thermocycler and as well as some reagents, but you can. Uh, it's a little bit more. Uh, do it yourself rather than you having to rely on um, cartridges from a, from a supplier. Um, but again, yeah, so plating is going to be your gold standard. If you can sort of build in the plating time into your process to once you've got a routine going, um, if you can even like hold back your or product or at least start to see um, some of your in-process samples before they even get into a can, you can start to see if there's any issues and you can react. Um, all right, so next slide. And so for selecting media, um, we do have some resources, I believe, on our blog about this as well. But there are uh, a number of different things you can choose. Um, I've only, uh, these are only a handful of ones you can choose from. There are other uh, medias available. Um, but for seeing any growth, um, you can use a universal beer, universal beer agar, which is not differential or selective. So um, we don't particularly enjoy using it at Escarpment. Um, one thing that you could use that we like using is um, Wallerstein's laboratory nutrient or differential medium. Um, it's more, it's designed more for breweries. Uh, you can see difference in colony morphology, um, and you can also screen for some uh, wild yeasts if you uh, add cyclohexamide to it. Um, another popular one with breweries is LMDA. Um, it has uh, calcium carbonate included in there, and you can see it's like a, it, it's very it's very powdery. It doesn't dissolve into the media, so you can see it um, little white flecks on the on the plates. 
if there is um, uh, a, a beer spoiler or a lactic acid bacteria that is produced uh, or, or in your sample, you'll see little clear spots on there. So it makes it very easy to see. Um, bacteria is very small, as Richard mentioned, it's very small and hard to, hard to see on plates. So this is a nice medium to use to, in order to see uh, that really readily. Next slide. For zeroing in on bacteria, so the more focused you get with your media, the better results you're going to see usually. They're more selective. You're going to see better morphology and that sort of thing. Um, a nice thing to use um, if you do not have an autoclave is HLP tubes. Um, you can, they're sort of a semi-solid uh, gel um, and you can sort of inject your sample directly or probe your sample right into the gel. Um, and it makes for a, an anaerobic environment for any kind of anaerobic, it's sort of an anaerobic environment, <laughs> a pseudo anaerobic environment. Uh, for uh, for any sort of like PEO or lacto to grow in, uh, it's not um, foolproof. It would be we would recommend that you have some sort of an anaerobic chamber to uh, to grow um, uh, your mo microbes on more like something like a MRS, which is what we'd recommend that you use. Um, uh, you'll get you'll be able to see uh, the colonies. You'll be able to sample the colonies to do the um, the tests that Richard was talking about in order to uh, understand, to know what the, the microbe is. Um, and the final one that I'm gonna talk about is LCSM, which is um, really the best we got for testing for diastatic. There are others as well, but this is, you know, you're, you'll be able to see something in about three days. Um, there is copper sulfate in this medium, which, um, most uh, diastatic strains are resistant to. So if you see growth there, you're, you, can, um, you're pre you can be pretty sure there is a diastatic yeast in there. You can also use your sensory um, tests as well to, to see if there's any um, trace of that. Um, you would want to also use PCR as a complement to, um, to verify these results. Um, but again, plating, has to happen first for the protocol that we use, uh, for example, um, because we have to um, use colonies in order to grow or in order to use the uh, for genetic material. Next. All right, so equipment. This is very a very, very basic uh, list of equipment that you might need. Um, can you go to the next slide? I just wanted to point to this resource. Um, this is from the, uh, it's a slide that it's available to everyone or it's a, it's a PDF that's available to everyone from the American Society of Green Chemists. It's called Growing Your Quality Laboratory. Um, and it, it very clearly um, gives you recommendations on what you should be uh, including in your brewery uh, based on your size. So it's a nice, it's a nice one. I really like uh, recommending that one. Um, next slide. All right, and um, so this is what it looks like when you put it all together and um, you have a plan. So this is, you know, this is your weekly plan. This is what you would select. This is what you would um, test for. Um, so I don't know, you can kind of see this would be doable uh, to do in a, you know, if you're in between <laughs> like waiting for a, a boil or, or, or something like that, like you can start working on this or hopefully you can um, have hire someone uh, like a microbiology student, that'd be awesome to, to run this for you. But anyway, this is your starting point and this is where you wanna start um, recording what you see, especially as well. Can you go to the next slide? Um, and yeah, so if you do get hits, if you do start to see stuff, stuff growing, uh, you want to write it down. Um, don't have to get fancy. Um, you can just use a binder. You can use an uh, Excel spreadsheet, but you definitely want to start writing stuff down. Um, you're not going to remember <laughs> everything. Um, so you want to document what you see, when you saw it, uh, what batch it was, what tank it was. Um, and uh, you know, s start recording these things. Um, if you see a significant amount of contamination, you may wanna put your product on hold 
or you may want to go ahead and try to uh, remedy the situation. Maybe you're going to go and try to refilter or so on and so forth. Um, you're going to maybe potentially look at your sanitation program, see where you can tighten things up, find where this is coming from, sample more. Um, maybe you need to use other media. Um, but once you have figured it out, consider adopting a corrective action, preventative action program for your brewery, um, where you um, write down what your root cause was, uh, document that, and then also maybe change some SOPs in order to never see this problem again. Um, anyway, that's gravy. <laughs> but if you can do that, that would be awesome. Like you would see that you wouldn't repeat these things over and over again, and you would just, you know, changing your process um, can make a, a big difference. Um, next slide. Yeah, so every, un every brewery is unique. So I you know, I tried to give you a broad strokes what you can do, at, you know, for everybody. But um, you will, as you start to test, you'll start to see that there is different flora <laughs> in your brewery than there is for the brewery down the street. So you can get to know what the levels are in your brewery, what is normal, what levels, you know, um, that you're going to start to see um, differences, especially if you pair it with a sensory program, you're going to see you know, how many CFU it takes to start to notice some of these differences or colony forming units, I should say, they, to notice uh, actual like taste changes in your beer. Um, but yeah, so you're gonna have to put some thought into what makes sense for you. Um, it's really important that everyone's got to buy into this if you start adopting a quality program. Um, it's This is the hardest part, I think, is to getting, getting people to understand why it's important. And, um, yeah, start simple and build on that. Document, document, document. Um, and remember that micro is only a small part of your quality program. Um, some resources, the ASBC is not very expensive to join um, and it has a wealth of information. They have validated methods that you can use um, as well as uh, webinars like this to learn more from. Um, Brewers Association also, uh, I, I just br breeze through sampling, but they have really great videos on how to sample from a tank as well as how to plate uh, as well. Um, and we, <laughs> unfortunately we're not running it right now, but I wrote this a while ago, but anyway, so we would normally would run some courses, um, in-person courses where we would teach you, but that's of course on hold right now, but hopefully in the future we can get back together again and, and we'll teach you some of the stuff hands-on. And one more slide. Um, if this is too overwhelming, <laughs> um, we are here to help. So whether it be making plates for you, uh, we can send you plates. Um, we can also test the samples for you. Uh, and something kind of neat coming up um, is that we'll be having a, uh, a uh, subscription service. So if so we can be here routinely to uh, to test your samples. And um, yeah, so we're excited about that. So hopefully that'll launch early next year. Um, and that is it for me. I'm sorry for the speed, but I'm just trying to, <laughs> trying to keep on time here. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Timing wise, I know there's been a few of these with uh, uh, with 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 Nate where we've gone on to an hour and a half or so. So uh, I uh, <laughs> should have made that clear up front. <laughs> an hour is the target, but it is not the rule. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that that was awesome, Louisa. Thanks thanks for uh, for covering those things. Um, Especially, I think the the slide on you know how a small brewery can set up a sampling plan that's that's going to give them meaningful data and you know uh, not be a ludicrous amount of work. I think that's really awesome. Uh, hoping hoping that that can that could be shared a little bit wider. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for mentioning the the QC course that we run. Obviously, that's that's a lot harder with uh, with COVID. Um, despite my best efforts of. Uh, trying to encourage the team to turn that into a uh, digital delivery format. Uh, uh, we're not, we're not so sure that that would be feasible. So we are hoping that, you know, when uh, either, either when COVID is 
is over or uh, we're able to figure out how to deliver that to the same degree of quality in a remote format, then uh, we'll be able to uh, reintroduce some of those uh, you know, lab skill building because you know that is one of the uh, the hard part about learning microbiology, but the amazing part about microbiology is that it's hands-on, right? Um, it's a very hands-on thing. And, you know, especially when we think about science, oftentimes it's very abstract. No, no, no. Uh, microbiology is like cooking, right? You're just cooking for microbes. <laughs> um, so, you know, that that's a lot of fun. Uh, we have some questions, so I'm going to go ahead and dive into those. Um I saw a lot of great commentary in the site as well. So I just want to thank everyone for chiming in. Um, I'll also mention we have our final webinar of 2020 uh, in December. Uh, that's scheduled for December 8th. Um, that is going to be on the importance of oxygen uh, in, in beer, in, uh, in especially for yeast health. Uh, really excited for that topic. Uh, Nate is slated to be presenting that one, although he does have a baby on the way, so it might end up being me, but one way or another, we'll, we'll get that one shared. Okay, Louisa, here we go. In a brewery producing exclusively barrel-aged mixed culture fermentations, which aspects are the most critical in a comprehensive sampling plan? Whew. That's a tough one, Ernesto. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to leave that I'm going to give you that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean I can't I we don't have a lot of experience with that. I you know in general the folks that are doing uh focus on mixed culture fermentations typically aren't doing very extensive micro monitoring. Um Although, you know, it's not impossible. Uh, I've done a little bit of micro monitoring for mixed firm beers, just like in terms of trying to get a grasp on batch to batch consistency. And, and that that worked OK. Like it was in that case, it was kind of a matter of you know, every time that mixed culture was repitched, um, plating out the slurry that was harvested and comparing that to the pictures I had of the previous generation and um, you know, that, that's been a useful exercise. Um, it's been possible to sort of predict some deviations in the mixed culture that way, you know, see one yeast start to, um, or bacteria start to sort of outperform others. And you, you often then see the performance of the mixed culture go out of whack, but I will say it's, it's a lot harder than just monitoring, like, is there one yeast in this beer or is there anything else? <laughs> right. So it, it's a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. um, would NaOH sodium hydroxide work instead of KOH for lysing? Don't know. I've never tried. We should not, though. Just yeah, drop a try. drop a caustic. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I think, okay, I think that was answered already. Uh, heat sanitization. You might be able to answer this one. Uh, how reliable is it in terms of microbiology? Uh, for example, when doing transfer to the fermentation, uh, from the fermentation vessel into the bright tank, or oh, not sure I'm understanding this. Transfer from the fermentation vessel into the bright tank at 180F. So, I mean, I guess that would be pasteurization between the fermenter and the bright tank. That would be uh, uncommon. Uh, okay. I guess the question is like, <laughs> maybe the question could be like, how can the effectiveness of, of heat treatment be monitored? Yeah. Um, so I see I'm, I'm cheating because I saw Kyle mention PUs. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> uh, it does depend on PUs, but I, for, um, it, again, like you would have to validate it, right? So you can, lots of things can happen while you are heating up a vessel or, you know, you don't know if you're going to get an even heat distribution, um, you know, 
or if there's like a cooling effect that like you're, you're not sure if this is going to happen. So the best way to do it is to plate it and make sure. But in general, heat, uh, using heat to kill microbes is very effective. Um, that said, you don't have to go to that extreme um, using sanitizing products as long as you're making it in the right concentration um, is also very effective too. Um, but, uh, but again, validation is where it comes down to. Make sure that it's actually doing what what you're planned on it on doing. Yeah, you got to check. You got to check. <laughs> uh, next question is: Do you guys post the slides from all these webinars anywhere? And if not, then can you? Thanks. We've been pretty good at posting the uh, replays on YouTube, but we have not been very good at posting these slideshows. So. Um, that is something that I think we're going to try to tackle this winter. Um, it's been a pretty, pretty, uh, crazy year. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I know that, I know that I've had a few people reach out about a few of the slide decks and, you know, we're happy to pass that along, but we'll, uh, probably start uploading those on our website, uh, sooner than later as well. Any preference between LMDA and WLD? Um, so they do slightly different things. Um, I personally find LMDA tough to work with. <laughs> <laughs> tough to make. It's tough to make those plates. Um, they, just because of the, the, the chalky residue that, you know, to try to get that amount of that calcium carbonate across all the plates, it's, it's tough to do. So I prep, my preference is I'm, I kind of, we, we stay away from it, to be honest. Um, but we also, yeah, so we use a combination of WLN and, um, and MRS um, in order to, to do the same thing as a LMDA plate does. So that's the drawback is the chalk, the chalky residue. Yeah, it is, it is a challenge, honestly, like that is, I, I, I think that that's totally valid is that, you know, getting that medium consistent plate to plate is, is tricky, right? Because you have um, the calcium carbonate in there, the chalk, that's just like it, the whole point of it is that it's kind of not really in solution, right? So um, that does mean that you can have some variability from plate to plate. Um, it works well, but we, yeah, we, we've had no compelling reason to use it versus something like WLD or, or MRS, um, you know, having screened a lot of the lactic acid bacteria on all of those media. Mm -hmm. What kind of flame would you suggest? A Bunsen burner? Okay. Uh, many, yeah, there's many flames that, that would work. Bunsen burner would work. Um, those sort of like, a, I guess they're like oil lamps. I don't know what you would call them. Like the, you'd put the solvent in for as, use as a burner. That works as well. Um, I've seen folks use those like little cooking torches, like those creme brulee torches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, those work. Um, so as long as it's, as long as the flame, I think we, you know, use these little, um, those little camping propane um, uh, portable tanks. What are they called? They're not tanks. <laughs> They're canisters. Little, little canisters. And uh, they make a nice flame. They make a nice, um, a uh, strong flame with a, along with a Bunsen burner. Um, yeah. Yeah, again, heat, heat kills everything. So it's a pretty effective tool. <laughs> okay. Um, not a microbiological question, but more overall quality plan. Should GMP and HACCP be the first steps in developing a quality plan before working on the lab and testing protocols? Also, should HACCP just focus on the beer safety, uh, food safety, or should it include quality control as well? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Uh, GMPs are completely applicable to a brewery, right? So um, uh, GMPs are good manufacturing practices. Um, the tenants of that is uh, one of the tenants is, is uh, documentation. So you want to make sure you have very good records. Um, they don't hurt, but um, I personally find the 
regulations to be um, kind of overwhelming and written in <laughs> written in uh, hard to like it's not super hard to understand, but it's it's complex language, and I prefer a common sense approach, right? So I think yeah, a common sense sense approach as long as you're thinking of where things might lurk, um, writing things down, um, being thorough with your process from beginning to end. Um, if you apply these like tenants, you be, you'll be in good shape. Um, I, the industry is moving towards a HACCP uh, global food safety initiative type um, or and traceability programs. I know are are are, uh, are um, required here in our local area. Um, so these things are gonna these things are gonna come come along. Yeah, but um, uh, I think we're still you know we're we're crawling towards getting better with these things. Um, but it's, I, I tend to shy away from using a lot of that. I don't know, maybe I, I hopefully I'm not saying the wrong thing here, but I, I, I just think that there's uh, a lot that you have to think about when running a brewery and your resources are, are very thin. Um, so I think, you know, start with what makes sense. Um, and then build from there. Yeah, I would say that. You don't want to <laughs> stack too many cards against you. Um, one thing I will say, you know, because we're we're going through this as well in in you know um, improving uh, our our own um, adherence to food safety standards as as you know the landscape is changing. Um, we we found ourselves that having a strong internal quality program has made implementing something like HACCP a heck of a lot easier, you know, because we already have that understanding of what are the, the critical control points and, and how can we do monitoring that ensures that um, there is some um, analysis of, of the output of the tr those critical control points. Like, for example, you know, one of those for us is, you know, making sure that the, uh, yeast media gets boiled, right? That, that's a critical control point. If it doesn't happen, then there's things that can go wrong. Well, how do we check for that? We do, we, we have a micro program that allows us to ensure, you know, uh, uh, that that process has been completed. Um, so they, they really do complement each other. And, and that would be my, you know, sort of suggestion is <laughs> whatever is the first easy win, and whether that's bringing in plating or whether that's, you know, having a, a really basic CASA plan, you know, whatever the easy win is, do it first, and then you'll get buy-in from your team to, you know, sort of continue bringing these things on. And you guys are gonna see value from it. You know, there's a reason these uh, are industry standards and it's not just bureaucracy. Oftentimes these things work to improve quality and, and decrease failure. Mm -hmm. Um. And then the last question that I think we'll answer is another one that's, that's specific to a chemical supplier. And I'll just, I'll just answer that through typing um, was what, <laughs> this is a question that I don't think we can answer. Uh, what PPV oxygen are you seeing Zymomonas and MPEC at? And I, I'm not sure. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, it's relatively understood, well understood that, that these are anaerobes, but some of them can be slightly facultative. Um, there might be some, some details in the literature on those. Um, and there are some good, uh, articles out, I think either in ASBC journal or master brewers quarterly, um, a, uh, quality, quality technician named Eric Jorgensen did an awesome review article where he sort of covered a lot of uh, information about brewing bacteria and a lot of the science that was known. And that's, that was the source material for a lot of my presentation. So shout out to Eric Jorgensen for that. Um, you might be able to find some of those answers in there. Cool. Um, I think we will call it a night at that. Mm. Um, thanks again, Louisa, for, uh, for, for pitching in. And, uh, you know, as, as mentioned as well, we are working on some, some ways to make it easier for brewers to um, to do quality monitoring. And part of that might be 
um, not necessarily having to invest in a lab and, you know, having a system where those uh, beer samples can be shipped to a centralized lab that takes care of some of that processing and, and also some of the, uh, you know, interpretation of the results, which is all, you know, one of the harder parts. So pretty excited to see um, what comes of that. Uh, do you have anything to add, Louisa? Um, no, um, I'm excited that everyone was so engaged because I know it's, <laughs> it can be kind of dry. So that's wonderful. <laughs> and it's nice to see that there's interest here in it, uh, building for uh, on this topic. Yeah, yeah, that that's awesome to see as well. Um, and and I do apologize for talking so long about <laughs> about fantastic bugs, um, but I'm I'm glad we were able to make it work. Mm. And I promise to talk less in the next in the next talk, unless uh, <laughs> in, unless Nate's got a newborn and I've got to step in. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks right. for having me anyway. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you again in December.